I saw 300 men go out, and uh, towards the end, I heard a lot of shooting, and towards the end of the day, I saw 30 men come back. We were shelled all night. A friend of mine, a friend of mine, the shell hit him and just blew him up. Couldn't find nothing of him. There's a suffering that takes place there. There's a mental and physical suffering that you experience nowhere else. And I believe that was Patton showing off what his people could do. But the carnage on the river was, was terrific as a result. If he'd waited, a lot more men would have lived. And I condemn him for that. Just as thick as any combat you've ever seen in any movie you'll ever see. In the first two months of battle, the 20th Corps lost over 10,000 men, fully one-third of their strength. American soldiers found themselves severely outmanned and outgunned, with little or no tank support, because General Patton had taken his tanks up north to the Battle of the Bulge, leaving the 20th Corps in a holding position in southwestern Germany. It would turn out to be the most severe German winter in over 50 years. In December 1942, a year after the start of World War II, the United States Army recruited several thousand high IQ, academically elite young men into a newly created unit called the Army Specialized Training Program, the ASTP. They were promised officer rank during their active service and a college education during the war. It was a much prized program nicknamed by the recruits themselves as the ASTP, always safe till peacetime. I enlisted in the uh, specialized training program. I had been assigned to the University of Wisconsin. And I was assigned to Washington State University. Actually, they put me in the ASTP, which was a bunch of boys supposed to go to college. But first you've got to take 13 weeks of infantry, infantry basic. That should be a clue that I'm not going to go to college. Casualties on the European front were becoming far higher than anticipated. And in February of 1944, the men of the ASTP learned that their program had been canceled. Their destiny was changed overnight. Uh, they decided that they needed more bodies than they did engineers. The program was canceled when I was in the middle of basic training. I didn't even finish basic training. I wasn't even supposed to be in the infantry. I was supposed to be in medical school. Through a series of ill-fated events, 3,000 of these young men would eventually find themselves on the front lines of some of the bloodiest battles of World War II. In August of 1944, they crossed the Atlantic Ocean on the Queen Elizabeth and then were shipped to Normandy two months after the horrific battles of D-Day. For the next three months, they were left in a holding position in northern France, where they saw very limited action. Casualties were minor, and they started to believe once again in their ASTP motto, always safe till peacetime. But all that changed on Christmas Eve, 1944. A Belgian troop ship, the SS Leopoldville, was bringing in U.S. Army reinforcements from Southampton, England, through German U-boat infested waters. A ship called the Leopoldville was coming across the English Channel and it was sunk by a German submarine, so they lost 800 men. With the loss of these 800 soldiers, 
Supreme Allied Headquarters decided that the 94th Division would be called up from France to replace them. The young men of the ASTP were being sent to serve on the front lines of the final battle for Germany. They were supposed to go to Germany, but they were decimated so much, so they took our place in Normandy and we went to Germany. On January 10, 1945, the 3,000 soldiers of the ASTP became part of the 15,000-man 94th Infantry Division, one of three divisions that made up the 20th Corps of the U.S. 3rd Army, under General George S. Patton, Jr. Suddenly, this group of ASTP youngsters who thought they were going to college found themselves in Nazi Germany as frontline infantrymen. Rifles in hand, they were now to become part of the brawn, not the brains, of the U.S. Army. Uh, the first part we had to go in is called the Th Siegfried Switch Line in our language. The Saar River comes in and there's the uh, Moselle and there was this triangle and this was full of pillboxes and dragon's teeth to keep the tanks out and minefields and it was a pretty nasty fortress. The Saar Moselle Triangle was always considered one of the key areas of defense for the German Reich. The top of the triangle was formed by the joining of two rivers, the Saar and the Moselle. The southern base was 13 miles long and ran from Nenig in the west to Orschels in the east. The Americans would soon learn that this was also a highly fortified portion of Hitler's infamous Siegfried Line. Here it consisted of defensive positions up to two miles in depth, protected by a thicket of dragon's teeth obstructions and anti-tank ditches, with a network of hidden pillboxes and concrete bunkers. By this time, General Patton had moved the other two corps of his Third Army up to the Battle of the Bulge, taking with him his tanks and most of his artillery. It was against this backdrop that the Ghost Corps learned of General Patton's decision. Attack, attack, attack. The attack order came down on January 12, 1945. The 20th Corps was to go after key positions within the Triangle, under the command of Major General Harry J. Maloney, spread out along the Siegfried Line, so they would be able to attack multiple targets simultaneously. The 1st Battalions were to attack the towns of Tettingen and Butzdorf, while further north, there were to be attacks on Nenning, Weiss, and Berg. In the south, the troops were to hit Orschels. This was all part of a larger plan to break through the Siegfried Line, then move forward through the town of Sins, across the Saar River, and finally on to the Rhine. The Ghost Corps was to carry out their formidable schedule of attacks with virtually no armored support. Even the promised air support would not materialize due to the disastrous winter weather. Determined resistance was expected, as the Germans had years to prepare their positions. The heavily fortified Siegfried Line was bounded by extensive minefields and covered by concealed pillboxes and bunkers with interlocking fields of fire. When combined with snow, fog, and freezing rain, the Siegfried Line was an infantryman's nightmare. And so, in separate battalions of only 1,000 men each, the 20th Corps prepared their invasion into the heart of Germany. The fortunate sons of the ASTP we're about to have their first taste of battle. First realization that something is happening when the first night you looked out and you could see flashes in the sky. And I said, what do you do uh, when you're out there? He said, fire that gun, boy, shoot it. So I did do a lot of it. Being honest, I think all of us were scared. walk into this thing and these guys are shooting at you and you got to keep going and uh, either kill them or they kill you.
As the U.S. battalions began their initial strikes, they were met with the fierce resistance of entrenched German troops. This was a battalion assault, and A Company and 1st Platoon of B Company, which I was in, went into Tennington and Butzdorf, and we were surrounded four or five days. A lot of casualties during that period of time. The operation soon became a slugfest between U.S. and enemy infantry. It would become known as the Brawl in the Saar. We're going to go on and take the next town, which was Butzdorf, and so we, uh, the A Company, went out, and that was a big mistake. The military always say you're supposed to take the high ground first. Well, we went through the low ground, and they were beating the hell out of us with mortars. It's so much easier to look down and shoot down, and much more difficult to, well, first of all, you're moving, and the guys up on top of the hill are stationary. And so, here, when you move, sooner or later you're going to be seen. The guy up at the top has a clear view, and um, we lost heavily. In some of the small German towns, the early morning American strikes came swiftly and as a complete surprise, catching German garrisons off guard and in some cases, sound asleep. In the little towns of Nenning, Berg, and the Wise, there were just three little hamlets there together. We took a few prisoners there. I think we were the first unit of the 94th to go through there. We entered the town uh, early in the morning. We caught the Germans asleep. And uh, we took that town without too much trouble. Different, we, take, we took so many towns, there were so many towns and so many prisoners and everything that we took that uh, it was hard to describe. The U.S. troops took over several target areas, even though they were outnumbered and without tank support. Uh, obviously, you're terrified of what's no, going nobody, to happen. Nobody knew in advance how they were going to react. And at one time, I was absolutely convinced that I'd never see 21. Uh, you know, I just, I just knew I wasn't going to make it. But you were scared to death all the time. But you still, the Lord give you enough courage and power to go ahead and do what your job required you to do. I tell you this, it, it was not like Hollywood, and, and the guys are always looking so fresh. Uh, you mentioned this book, Foley's book. And he's quite an artist, and he has captured the expressions on those people's faces. Looking tired, scared. Oh, how he, he did a beautiful job. Among the men of Patton's 20th Corps was an extraordinary young artist, 18-year-old William Foley. Under the stress of battle, he turned to his art as a source of calm creating a visual diary of his war front experiences. Sketching with pencil stubs on any form of paper he could find, Foley managed to keep a number of his drawings intact until the fighting ended. After the war, he added color to some of them. I became so excited at this jump in my maturity. I don't think I realized it then, probably years later, I realized that if you can become a man overnight in combat, other things make that leap along with you, your ability to draw, whatever it is. On October 20th of 2003, Bill Foley's wartime mural of the 94th Division was officially dedicated in the Massachusetts State House. Governor Mitt Romney honored the men of the 94th as he accepted this welcome addition to the Capitol building in Boston.
The 94th Division had now penetrated about two miles into the Siegfried Line. When Hitler heard about this, he was furious. Nazi troops were ordered to retaliate by retaking the fallen towns and driving the Americans back. It started with a murderous artillery barrage. Then came the expected counterattack, with wave after wave of German troops. Casualties were heavy on both sides, but General Maloney had planned well, and the Americans continued to strike quickly, strategically, and in small numbers, in many cases outflanking and encircling their enemy. In a later campaign, a captured German officer, Colonel Karl Thiem, would tell his U.S. interrogators that the Germans referred to the 20th Corps as the Ghost Corps, because they moved so fast and so often that we never knew where this enemy was going to strike next. With the 20th Corps now spread out and holding several towns along the Siegfried Line, the Germans decided to take further steps. I was asleep, being relieved from guard duty, when all of a sudden I heard the rattle of tanks. That they brought in their best, best crack armored division to hold it, the 11th Panzer Division, and they had orders to hold that at all costs. Their famed 11th Panzer Tank Division was headed toward action at the Bulge, but they were quickly diverted to launch a new series of counterattacks against the Americans in the Triangle. The 11th was at full strength, well rested and ready for a fight. This was an elite, battle-tested division, recently brought down from the Russian front to protect the fatherland. Their attacks began on January 18th, utilizing rockets, mortars, and heavy artillery, after which several hundred Panther tanks, plus the new and larger Tiger tanks, swept into action. The Ghost Corps, without tanks, had a fight on their hands. They were coming in on our side of town, from the direction of Sins, through this valley, in the form of an arc. They were firing their machine guns and shooting their 88s into town as they went by. And the Stars and Stripes at one point said the 94th Division, Infantry Division, is fighting its own private war with the 11th Panzer. Well, that bothered us a bit, an infantry outfit fighting a cracked Panzer. They had the same reputation for appearing where they were least expected. They were very experienced. I don't know how we fought them off. They had fought in Russia for three or four years. We backed up our street into a cleared section this big, fired one round, killed almost, almost everybody in our first squad. Squad, squad, squad. The tree burst up about 12 or 15 feet, shrapnel just coming down out of the sky like snow. Well, all we could do was get on our bellies and, and pray. A shell come right close. I turned to him and I said, boy, I said, that one was close. He didn't, he didn't, didn't hear a peep out of me, he didn't say anything. I didn't think of, his teeth were chattering, you could hear his teeth chattering. He was, we heard the sound of many more tanks, maybe 20 to 30 coming down the hill with self-propelled guns. And it was rifles fighting against tanks. And we couldn't hurt them. But we stayed in our positions until we were told to leave. Two men was killed in town. Three had frozen feet. The rest of one was shot through the left eye and came out over here on the side. One fellow was hit in the leg, ankle with shrapnel. One was hit in the thigh with shrapnel. I was the only one left in the squad. <laughs> firing, and they, they were ordered to quit firing because we were, we were giving up for a lot. They said that we were gone, and they were actually 
got together and were forming another A company uh, with the Jeep drivers and the cooks that were left. And you're at a disadvantage uh, if uh, you know you, you go against a situation like that, and you're 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 afraid before you before you even get committed. You're going to get killed, or you're going to kill somebody. Now you better make up your mind. You're going to kill somebody. So a lot of guys just. They can't control that fear. It's, it's awfully frightening. Frightening. frightening, frightening. Over the next few days, the 94th took many casualties. They were fighting overwhelming odds using only rifles and bazookas. Tanks were coming through the buildings and the guys would move back and, and then they'd get off the side and blow the tread off a, off a tank. And, this knitting campaign, just about everything was heroic. You know, talking about guys on the top of the house wiping out a tank with a bazooka. We, we managed to get a bazooka far through a window in our room and stopped the tank dead. We could hear men in there yelling, Nick Sheeson, Nick Sheeson. So we assumed they were going to come out and surrender. In the meantime, more tanks are coming in close, and this platoon is trying to defend itself and doing a pretty good job. A few of the Germans got to the houses, but no further. And no infantrymen got into Butzdorf at all. It was just tanks, because the infantry, it usually accompanies the tanks, was just being blown away. The carnage on both sides was devastating. Finally, the U.S. 8th Armored Division was loaned to the operation. Even though the U.S. Sherman tanks were no match for the Panzers, the GIs held their ground and then were able to start pushing the German units back. When Patton learned of the courageous actions of the 94th, he sent word that the full strength of the mighty 10th Armored Division was on its way to the Triangle. The Siegfried Line had started to crumble but on the other side of the Siegfried Line lay the heavily fortified town of Orscholz. Before the 10th Armored arrived, things were going to get worse. In, in, in their Battle of Orscholz, they lost a load of men. Our attack was undersized. It was only a battalion attack of 1,000 persons versus a regiment of 3,000. Our scouts, our other, some of our other scouts, had found a hole in the German line. We were going to go through this line and we came to a road, we were going to turn right, attack, and capture Orschholz. And then C Company was more or less machine gunned down, and, and they, they didn't get across. We got across, and then we were, of course, captured and wiped out because we could not get back, and the, our troops could not reach us. And now we're surrounded. We were behind the German lines. Lost, practically the entire battalion. Uh, as I recall, we had probably less than less than 200 men left. We couldn't uh, continue because we had no more information or correspondence with our trunk flanks. It was completely cut off and we ran out of ammunition. We need help and we need it now because the men had trench foot and no ammunition and had no food for two days. Oh. A shell came in and hit a tree right over our head and exploded. And my runner, who I had, is carrying my little radio. And he and I went, you know, dug down in the trench as far as we could get. And this blast right, right here. And uh, when we got through, when it was over, I said, let's get out of here, Terrell. And I looked down, and there was a hole about that big in the top of his helmet and his brains were coming out. Regimental commander replied that they couldn't get to us for two days. Well, the captain, who was the highest ranking man, uh, said these men can't last two days anymore. So I'm forced to do what I think I have to do, put up the white rag. And that's what happened. As a result of the disaster in Orschholz, the troops' morale took a severe beating. Uh, I'm analyzed now with post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a form of a mental uh, disorder, really. And that's the only disorder 
that comes from uh, external forces. There was a couple times I was had to be sent back because of battle fatigue, which is a nervous breakdown. Combat fatigue is where you see a guy, uh, see a guy just shake uncontrollably. It's caused by, uh, it's caused by lack of sleep, uh, 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 the, 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 the build up and tension, the fatigue, uh, the, the horrible weather conditions. It's, it's a combination of things. But there was a time I literally was debating with my own soul about whether I could stand anymore. Everybody's got a breaking point. We all had the thousand yard stare. That comes from the constant fright of death and destruction and all the horrible things that we saw and experienced. Our medic was battle fatigued. Uh, he couldn't take it anymore. He had been a great medic for many months. His hair turned white overnight. You were scared all the time, but it seemed like it got easier. You kind of got bravery or something, thinking you weren't going to be the one, you know. And But when that artillery coming in, who knows? It was a thing that you were, you were there, you were a body, you were, you, you were there to do your job, whatever you were supposed to do, and if you survive, fine. After their victory at Sims, the 94th was ordered to keep marching on toward the Saar River. There they would face the toughest challenge of their fighting career. The next day, the men of the 94th arrived at the Saar River. They expected a much needed and well-deserved rest, time to recharge before the next attack. This was normal army procedure for infantry after days of continuous fighting. Walker told Maloney, he said, well, you can just lay up against this uh, Saar River until spring. The next afternoon, we got orders that we had to cross. Patton changed his mind. Patton wanted to cross the river, and the only the other side of the Saar River was the main Siegfried line. We couldn't wait any longer. We had to cross because, in coordination with the other companies that were crossing the Saar in different areas, the other generals wanted to bypass this place and come in from behind and, and pincer them, cut them off. And I was standing more than no more than eight or ten feet to Patton's right front and I heard them talking and praying all the time that they would prevail. But Patton used the language that he used, which I drove trucks and I've driven mules and I've never heard language like that anywhere except from him. And his statement was that he'd made up his mind to make their crossing or whatever, it takes a bushel basket full of dog tags and I'll go. Patton was in that town about a mile from the riverbank with a bunch of VIPs and news people and the reason why they were sent over in the daytime is so that these people could witness that big show. Patton had made up his mind. He was going to cross the Saar River now against the recommendation of the 20th Corps' General Walker. The crossing would prove to be a disaster. Commanded to cross the Saar, the division spread out in order to establish numerous crossing points. But Patton's demand to cross immediately had left no time for scouts to survey the other side of the river. Whatever defenses the Germans had planned for the invading Americans would be a complete surprise. And so they called out L Company and C Company, sent them out broad daylight down towards the river. I had smoke machines going up the river. And to get across the river, they were going to put us in flat bottom plywood boats. And you'd have two lines. We had 12 men to a squad. And you sit, supposed to be six guys, you sit on the, on the, down the line, and you sit on your knees open, back on your heels, and someone sits between your legs like this, and you carry your rifle out, a Browning automatic rifle I was carrying. There are two rows of us in these boats, and we roll the boat across. 
None of us had had any training in a boat, and we had two paddles. One of the things we hadn't expected, the Germans had put some wires, uh, barbed wire, in the water, which we didn't realize was there. And that was, <laughs> that was probably the most terrifying thing ever happened to me, because I don't swim with the dam. And get, it wouldn't have mattered with all the equipment if you fell in that river and it was at flood stage in wintertime. You'd have drowned probably in five minutes. The smoke helped us some, protected us some. Uh, but the Germans had uh, their, their pillboxes that they, this is part of the Siegfried line. The German waited till they got to the opposite side and they blew them out of the water. And three guys got hit. And I think one got killed. I never knew for sure, but I think he died later. One guy got hit in the leg, another one in the army. The L Company and C Company each lost about half of them. Captain Brightman of the L Company was killed there, and several other people were killed or wounded. But as far as I could see, and it wasn't all that far, but guys from my company had been hit. I don't know whether they were all killed or wounded, but anyway, there were a number of them that were along that they'd you know, gotten up in line and started to march and the Germans just wiped them out. They were firing at us. We got, when the bullets are within maybe a foot or so of your head, they make a sound that nothing else makes. A, I can't describe it. And you feel them hit your clothes, it's like very quick fingers put your clothes very quickly. And every one of us was hit. The fellow between my legs was killed, and the fellow on my left was killed. And to this day, I don't know their names. Their names, their names. This was at 12 o'clock in the daytime. The Germans later said that they were in the pillboxes, their foxholes looking down, and they said they simply could not believe that anybody would send troops out in broad daylight over that ground. And I believe that was Patton showing off what his people could do. But the carnage on the river was, was terrific as a result. If he waited two more hours, the sun goes down early in the winter time in Europe. If he'd waited, a lot more men would have lived. And I condemn him for that. You must remember this. That from Brest to various towns in southern Germany and Austria, whose names I can't pronounce, but who, whose places I have removed. <laughs> Men thought of Patton that he was so arrogant. They really didn't like him, but they liked the way he was accomplishing what he was doing. They called him blood and guts, our blood and his guts. Because he didn't have no good word for nobody. That guy didn't. He comes up with his Jeep, the sirens going, and he's got his pearl handle pistols, and I'm thinking, oh, God, you know, showtime. So, like I say. And he an, was an impressive figure when he stood up with his hands on his hips on his revolvers. He was a genius. I think almost everybody was uh, in, in favor of Patton. The greatest man I met was General Patton. I thought he was a you know, an asshole. At first, he didn't think much in the 94th. Patton came back and he just raised hell with him because we had so many non-combat injuries. General Patton, you men have disgraced the uniform of the American Army more than the soldiers of any other unit I have been associated with. I said at the time, I, I hated him with the passion. <laughs> You know, he certainly was a dynamic person. I admired the guy. That's the kind of guy we needed. He chewed us out because of, at B Company at Orschultz, Captain Straub surrendered because he could not be reached with any more supplies. He had ran out of ammunition. If any of you bastards want to surrender again, just leave your weapons and ammo behind. I can get all the replacement men I want, but I'm short on weapons. So that was, it was kind of shocking. He, he swore about every other brand. And he, he, he was rough. But I'll tell you one thing. I believe our officers were more scared of Patton than they were the Germans. Uh, he made statements to scare guys because he wanted us to be afraid of him so we would fight for him. I think he was a master of psychology. And I think what he did, he did deliberately to make us mad. And so you couldn't kill him, so you took it out on the Germans. He read all the books on the German generals and what their accomplishments were, and he knew every move they were going to make. 
That was so obvious when the Third Army went into action. He got us going so fast we ran out of maps. The you keep the attack going, and that was his principle, which is right, it saves lives. But we suffered. Without him, we wouldn't have gotten as far as we did. Patton was one of the most prominent and infamous figures of World War II. To this day, he is thought of as the preeminent leader of that war. Opinions of him varied widely, although most would agree that World War II would not have ended as soon as it did without him. With the men of the 94th finally crossing the Saar River and breaking through the secondary Siegfried line, Patton ordered the troops to continue east to the Rhine. The Germans were on the run, and the race to the finish was on. But there was one last target in Patton's sights, the strategic city of Trier. Trier was a big communication center. This was at a fork of two rivers, and it was highly walled. And Hitler said, no one, no one will ever get through there. They didn't give him enough troops. He kept getting orders from uh, uh, Eisenhower to not try to take Trier. It would take five divisions. Two divisions rushed into Trier. The German troops had no prior warning and were caught completely off guard. The Nazis could not believe that the Ghost Corps was so deep into Germany. Trier was taken. Hitler was shocked to learn of the Trier occupation. It would change the whole direction of the war. Hitler was surprised that Trier could fall. He said those defenses were so impenetrable that he didn't think that uh, they would uh, ever fall. The 94th Division got through, and this was just about the breaking point of Hitler because that was the last bastion that he felt uh, would hold, you know, and it didn't. It was now March 1st, 1945, and Patton was riding high. We took Trier, I remember very well, and he kept getting uh, uh, notices from Chafe, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. When they heard he was near Trier, he said, don't get near Trier with less than four divisions. And he wrote back and said, I've just taken it with two, the 10th and the 94th. Do you want me to give it back? Hermann Goring, Hitler's second in command, was later quoted as saying, we could not believe that these fortifications could be penetrated. The breakthrough near Trier was particularly depressing. That breakthrough was one of the great catastrophes of the German cause. After their victory in Trier, the 20th Corps now pushed forward to the Rhine. The Rhine River was Hitler's last defensive stronghold before Berlin. After Sins, the 94th had been given all the tanks and artillery it needed to make it to the Rhine. Patton's goal was to be the first Allied general to get his troops to that symbolic German last line of defense. It's about the 12th or 13th of March that we're going to have this major, major uh, offense to go to the Rhine River. You couldn't believe this because we were lucky to go maybe a couple hundred yards a day. And here we're going to go about 100 miles in 10 days. And once we got moving on that drive to the Rhine, it was just fantastic because it was a 24, you know, round-the-clock deal. We uh, followed tanks most of the way. Sometimes we rode them. Sometimes they'd bring in trucks and we'd jump a town or two. Once we broke out of the, out of the line, we just took off. And 94th had led it initially, this whole string of four divisions, and they would leapfrog. Uh, we would go for, you know, 20 to 30 miles, and then the one behind us would leapfrog over us and keep going, so at night and day. Patton's troops were now racing to the Rhine, and it was becoming apparent that the war was going to end soon. And we were just over, overrunning the Germans before they had a chance to get organized and shoot back. Just the chase was on. We were just chasing the Germans after that. And I was laying there, and it was... The leg was killing me, I was cold, 
and in walked a German soldier with a rifle on his shoulder and a potato masher in his belt and he's yelling, Krieg is fertig, alles kaputt. Uh, war is over, everything is dead. And my God, I was shaking, I sh thought sure I was a goner and he sat down next to me and started showing me his pictures of his wife and his children and his home and he, was, he just was sick of the war. And the 94th Division and our, our uh, company was the first one to hit the Rhine. Patton's Ghost Corps had finally made it to the Rhine River. Although he was not the first Allied commander there, he was well ahead of his British arch-rival, Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery. On March 24, 1945, Patton said, I drove to the Rhine River and went across the pontoon bridge. I stopped in the middle to take a piss, and then picked up some dirt on the far side in emulation of William the Conqueror. And for the first time since we've been there, the sun peeked through the clouds. And with the quietness and that sun coming out, you could see in their minds, these guys were thinking of home. And Lieutenant Krauss came around, he said, uh, Brian, don't you have a mouth organ in your pocket? I said, yes, I've got a harmonica. I said, why don't you play something? This is not good for the men. So I pulled out my harmonica and I began playing Home Sweet Home. I got sworn at, I got clouds thrown at me, but it broke the mood. The war in Europe would be over shortly. Patton, seldom known to praise anyone, now lauded the men of his 94th Infantry Division, the same men whom he had virtually abandoned only a few months earlier. General George S. Patton, Jr appreciated the contribution made by the 94th Infantry Division to the 20th Corps, and especially to his German campaign. He dubbed them his Golden Nugget. Citing their skill and their courage, Patton finally recognized the GIs as the heroes they were. In fighting for their country and for their lives, the men found that they had formed a bond that would last for the rest of their lives. Or you don't want to let them down, you know? And that's true, that's not just a trite thing. That's, that's really true, you, you feel that I'm not going to desert my, my buddy here. The bond between two men come pretty, pretty quick and, and lasting when you're in a war. I think it's more so than just being out as a friend at playing golf or something like that. You're as close to the guys here are, as you are your own brothers. We feel like brothers because each man depended on your buddy that was with you. There's a suffering that takes place there. There's a mental and physical suffering that you experience nowhere else. There's nothing else like it. And it's just a comradeship that is deeper than words. I have changed greatly since finding my, my division had reunions, seeing the men again, it was most Rewarding. We loved each other then. We respected each other then. For what we went through and to look at different ones today, the way we're aging each year, you know, and knowing each one that dies has got a story to tell. To tell. To tell. To tell. In 33 fighting days, from February 19th to March 24th, 1945, the 94th had moved 123 miles, taken more than 17,000 POWs, breached the main Siegfried line by establishing a bridgehead over the Saar River, and then smashed 85 miles into the Rhine. The men of the 94th were finally home and safe during peacetime.
I saw 300 men go out, and uh, towards the end, I heard a lot of shooting, and towards the end of the day, I saw 30 men come back. We were shelled all night. A friend of mine, a friend of mine, a shell hit him and just blew him up. Couldn't find nothing of him. There's a suffering that takes place there. There's a mental and physical suffering that you experience nowhere else. And I believe that was Patton showing off what his people could do. But the carnage on the river was, was terrific as a result. If he'd waited, a lot more men would have lived. And I condemn him for that. Just as thick as any combat you've ever seen in any movie you'll ever see. General Harry J. Maloney, spread out along the Siegfried Line, so they would be able to attack multiple targets simultaneously. The 1st Battalions were to attack the towns of Tettingen and Butzdorf, while further north, there were to be attacks on Nenning, Weiss, and Berg. In the south, the troops were to hit Orschels. This was all part of a larger plan to break through the Siegfried Line then move forward through the town of Sins, across the Saar River, and finally on to the Rhine. The Ghost Corps was to carry out their formidable schedule of attacks with virtually no armored support. Even the promised air support would not materialize due to the disastrous winter weather. Determined resistance was expected, as the Germans had years to prepare their positions. The heavily fortified Siegfried Line was bounded by extensive minefields and covered by concealed pillboxes and bunkers with interlocking fields of fire. When combined with snow, fog, and freezing rain, the Siegfried Line was an infantryman's nightmare. And so, in separate battalions of only 1,000 men each, the 20th Corps prepared their invasion into the heart of Germany. The fortunate sons of the ASTP were about to have their first taste of battle. First realization that something was happening when the first night you looked out and you could see flashes in the sky. And I said, what do you do uh, when you're out there? He said, fire that gun, boy, shoot it. So I did do a lot of that. Being honest, I think all of us were scared. walk into this thing and these guys are shooting at you. Just overnight. Uh, they decided that they needed more bodies than they did engineers. The program was canceled when I was in the middle of basic training. I didn't even finish basic no. training. I wasn't even supposed to be in the infantry. I was supposed to be in medical school. Through a series of ill-fated events, 3,000 of these young men would eventually find themselves on the front lines of some of the bloodiest battles of World War II. In August of 1944, they crossed the Atlantic Ocean on the Queen Elizabeth and then were shipped to Normandy, two months after the horrific battles of D-Day. For the next three months, they were left in a holding position in northern France, where they saw very limited action. Casualties were minor, and they started to believe once again in their ASTP motto, always safe till peacetime. But all that changed on Christmas Eve, 1944. A Belgian troop ship, the SS Leopoldville, was bringing in U.S. Army reinforcements from Southampton, England, 
through German U-boat infested waters. A ship called the Leopoldville was coming across the English Channel and it was sunk by a German submarine, so they lost 800 men. With the loss of these 800 soldiers, Supreme Allied Headquarters decided that the 94th Division would be called up from France to replace them. The young men of the ASTP were being sent to serve on the front lines of the final battle for Germany. They were supposed to go to Germany, but they were decimated so much, so they took our place in Normandy and we went to Germany. On January 10th, 1945, the 3,000 soldiers of the ASTP became part of the 15,000-man 94th Infantry Division, one of three divisions that made up the 20th Corps of the U.S. 3rd Army, under General George S. Patton, Jr. In the first two months of battle, the 20th Corps lost over 10,000 men, fully one-third of their strength. American soldiers found themselves severely outmanned and outgunned, with little or no tank support, because General Patton had taken his tanks up north to the Battle of the Bulge, leaving the 20th Corps in a holding position in southwestern Germany. It would turn out to be the most severe German winter in over 50 years. In December 1942, a year after the start of World War II, the United States Army recruited several thousand high IQ, academically elite young men into a newly created unit called the Army Specialized Training Program, the ASTP. They were promised officer rank during their active service and a college education during the war. It was a much prized program nicknamed by the recruits themselves as the ASTP, always safe till peacetime. I enlisted in the uh, specialized training program. I had been assigned to the University of Wisconsin. And I was assigned to Washington State University. Actually, they put me in the ASTP, which was a bunch of boys supposed to go to college. But first you've got to take 13 weeks of infantry, infantry basic. That should be a clue that I'm not going to go to college. Casualties on the European front were becoming far higher than anticipated. And in February of 1944, the men of the ASTP learned that their program had been canceled. Their destiny was changed. Suddenly, this group of ASTP youngsters who thought they were going to college found themselves in Nazi Germany as frontline infantrymen. Rifles in hand, they were now to become part of the brawn, not the brains, of the U.S. Army. Uh, the first part we had to go in is called the Th Siegfried switch line in our language. The Saar River comes in and there's the uh, Moselle and there was this triangle and this was full of pillboxes and dragon's teeth to keep the tanks out and minefields and it was a pretty nasty Fortress. The Saar Moselle Triangle was always considered one of the key areas of defense for the German Reich. The top of the triangle was formed by the joining of two rivers, the Saar and the Moselle. The southern base was 13 miles long and ran from Nenig in the west to Orschholz in the east. The Americans would soon learn that this was also a highly fortified portion of Hitler's infamous Siegfried Line. Here it consisted of defensive positions up to two miles in depth, protected by a thicket of dragon's teeth obstructions and anti-tank ditches, with a network of hidden pillboxes and concrete bunkers. By this time, General Patton had moved the other two corps of his third army up to the Battle of the Bulge, taking with him his tanks and most of his artillery. It was against this backdrop that the Ghost Corps learned of General Patton's decision. Attack, attack, attack. 
The attack order came down on January 12, 1945. The 20th Corps was to go after key positions within the Triangle. Under the command of Major 